Well, welcome everybody. We are so glad that you're joining in with us. Uh, to those of you at both of our campuses and those of you watching online, we are honored that you took time out of your weekend to be with us. And uh, man, we are so glad you're here. And uh, we're in the midst of this series, as you just saw from that video. Uh, we're studying the book of James this summer. And before we get into our next section, the part of the book that we're going to read today, uh, I want to take a couple of minutes and just make some observations about this section that we're going to read together because this is a section of the Bible that, uh, I'll just be honest, most non-Christians really, really like this and most Christians, uh, we're really uncomfortable with it. In fact, I would say that if you're somebody who's here today and you're still investigating what you believe about faith or Christianity or you would not consider yourself a church person, my guess is that the issue we're going to deal with today might be one of the reasons why you've kept Christianity at an arm's length. This might be one of the reasons that you've been hesitant to maybe embrace faith because maybe you saw this issue in some Christians that you know and you said to yourself, you know what, if that's how they think or if that's how they act, I don't really want anything to do with this. And when I read this in just a second, you may be one of those people that you want to like jump out of your seat and go, yes. Finally, somebody said it. Somebody nailed those Christians. Somebody should have said that a long time ago. Why don't they get this? And so this may be something that, that you enjoy. But on the other hand, if you are a, a, a Christ follower like me, it's just been my experience that a lot of us, we read these verses, and I hear a lot of Christians say things like this. They'll say, yeah, but I know what he said, but here's what he really means. You know, it's kind of like we want to qualify this. And the reason is because it's, it's a really hard teaching. It's one of those things that, well, the implications of what James has to teach us today, they're, they're really huge. In fact, I know a lot of Christians that, honestly, they kind of wish we could just gloss over this part because it, what we're going to learn today actually seems like it contradicts a lot of things that Christians believe and hold dear. And, and I think you'll see that in just a moment. And hopefully, I'll be able to make some, some sense out of it and, and, and see how it fits together. But it, a lot of this seems to contradict with some really clear teachings in the Bible. Now, I know I've got your attention now because you're thinking, well, what in the world are we going to read? So let's get to it, and we'll see if we can make some sense out of it as we go along and see what all the fuss is about. This passage comes from James chapter 2, and it's gonna, we're going to start with verse 14. So here's what James says to us. He says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them. And here's where James just is starting to introduce us to the topic that he ultimately wants to deal with uh, with us today. And he's really asking this question. What exactly is the relationship between faith and works or faith and deeds? In other words, what a person believes versus what a person actually does. And like I said earlier, if you are, have been skeptical of church people or Christianity, this is probably one of the reasons. You saw that there may be, between some of the people you know, there's an obvious gap between what some Christians say and what they do. You know some people who believe one way and they act another way. And so what James does is he starts this whole idea with asking a few rhetorical questions. See, he's not looking for a reply. Because the reply is obvious. And, and, and so that's not the point of asking the questions. He, and he asks it this way. He says, what good does it do if someone is claiming to have faith, but they don't have any deeds to go along with it? Can that kind of faith save them? And, of course, the obvious answer is no. It cannot save them. And no, it does them no good. Now, the key word in this verse that I want you to see, and we'll highlight it here, is the word claims. That's the key word that I want you to look at. He's saying, look, there, he's not calling out faith per se. He's calling out faith, someone who claims to have faith. See, that's the point he's trying to make. So he's, he's not saying that faith doesn't matter. What, what James is saying is there's a lot of people out there who claim to have faith in God, claim to have a faith in Jesus, but they're just not taking that faith very seriously. So again, he's not saying faith is bad by itself, but he's saying there's a certain approach to faith that's wrong, a faith that makes a claim and it doesn't back it up. You may already knew this, but did you know that 90% of Americans uh, claim to have some sort of faith in God? And in fact, when studies are done and, and they ask people who claim to have faith in God, they find that 
about half or a little more than half of those people, their faith has, has pretty much made no apparent difference in their lifestyle or in the way that they live. That what they believe or what they claim to believe just hasn't made any apparent difference in how they live. Their behavior is still the same. It hasn't changed whatsoever. And so what James is pointing out in this passage is he's saying, look, if, is if, if faith doesn't have any effect on your life, then what good is faith doing for you? And see, this shouldn't surprise any of us because, see, we believe this about every other part of our lives. I mean, you accept this is true about everything. I'll give you an example. If I were to ask everybody in this room right now to raise their hands and say, who believes that diet and exercise is good for your body? Every hand in the room would go up. We all believe that. But now, we all also understand that if you actually do nothing with that belief, your body doesn't get healthy. See, it's not the belief that makes you healthy. <laughs> and if you do nothing with your belief, you stay the same. Your beliefs won't make you healthy. It's the doing part that changes everything. Like, for instance, you can believe that if I spend less money and I, or I, I spend less money and I save more money, well, that pattern over time is going to wind up with me being more wealthy or more financially stable. See, we all believe that. We all know that's true. But you actually have to take that belief and put it into action if you're ever going to receive the results. And that's all James is saying about faith. In fact, Jesus himself said something very similar to this. Look at what Jesus said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So again, Jesus is doing the same thing. He's making a distinction between someone who claims with their words to believe something, and yet... They don't have actions to back them up. There's a distinction between what a person says and what a person actually does. And he's saying, look, if the two don't match up, well, the words are just useless. Even the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, and we read lots of his words around here a lot of the time, he, he wrote in a very short letter. It's in a book in your Bible called the book of Titus. He was writing to a guy named Titus. It's one of those books that most people just gloss over because it's so short. But he's describing this very person in this letter that he wrote. Look at what he said. He said, they claim to know God, but their, by their actions, they deny him. Now, notice there's that word again, that word claims. He says, the claim, it's not enough. People's actions, that's what reveals the true state of their heart, of what really is going on on the inside. Their actions reveal what they truly believe. And now James, back to his uh, statements, he's going to continue on this talk a little bit. And he's going to give us a specific example of, of how this works out in real life. Look at what he says in verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is that? See, a lot of people claim to care about the needs of others. And James says, look, that's fine if, if you say you care about somebody, but if that claim that you make never leads you to do anything for them, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know this is true. Nobody cares how bad you feel for them if, if at the end of the day they're still hungry and cold. Your concern does not help anybody. It doesn't help you. It certainly doesn't help them. But it's your actions or your generosity in action that makes all the difference. You know, one of the most famous stories that Jesus ever told, in fact, you don't even have to be a Christian or a Bible person to know this story. I think everybody's heard of the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember that story? Jesus tells this example, he tells it in a story form. He says there was a certain man, he was going down a road, he was traveling, and while he's traveling, he gets jumped by this gang, and they, they beat him up, they rob him, they leave him for dead on the side of the road. And he said two very religious people come walking by, and they see him on the side of the road. And, and, and they just don't do anything. They just walk on by him. And then Jesus says, but this Samaritan, he comes down the road and he sees the man lying there in the ditch and he, he stops. He helps him. He takes care of him. He, he, he provides for his needs until he gets well. And then Jesus holds the Samaritan up as the hero of his story. Now, what's really interesting about that story, and maybe you never thought about it this way, is that the two men who walk on by, the guy who's on the side of the road, they are more like Jesus than the Samaritan in that 
they believe all the same things that Jesus believes. They came from the same religious background that Jesus did. But the Samaritan doesn't. In fact, he would not share some of the same beliefs that Jesus would share. He's, he's not like Jesus in that way. And yet Jesus makes him the hero of the story. Now, I don't think Jesus is trying to endorse what this guy believes. That's not the point of the story. In fact, he would probably disagree with some of the beliefs this man had. But that's not the point he's making. The point Jesus is making is that, look, even though these other two guys had all their beliefs squared away, they believed all the right things, and they said all the right things, and, and they had it all together in that department, spiritually speaking. And even though they probably felt compassion for the man in need, they still got it wrong. Their beliefs and their feelings did them absolutely no good. It did them no good, and it certainly didn't do the man in need any good either. See, we often confuse feelings with caring. We think that, and we even talk about it this way, we talk about love and we write about it in poems and sing about it in songs and we talk about love mainly about how we feel toward other people. And there's nothing wrong with feelings. But your feelings don't matter if they don't match your actions. The Apostle John, he writes this in 1 John 3. He says, if anyone has material possessions and he sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, or he doesn't do anything about it, how can the love of God be in that person? See, true faith always leads to Christ-like action. And again, there's nothing wrong with feelings. We all need those. And there's nothing wrong with, with belief. We all need that too. But if it's real, if it's genuine, it's going to lead to some actions. In other words, your life, my life, ultimately reveals what I truly believe. So James goes, James goes on in verse 17. He says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And See, right here, James makes a clear distinction between the kinds of faith that he's talking to us about. Because remember, as I said before, he's not calling out faith as being a bad thing. He, he's, he's trying to deal with a certain kind of faith. And he says, look, there's two kinds. He said, there's, there's one that's alive, and there's one that's dead. And he's just challenging you, and he's challenging me. All of us who claim to have faith, he's challenging all of us. Consider which kind you have. Is it dead? Is it alive? And he says, faith that exists by itself, if it's not accompanied by any kind of action, well, you can know that's the dead faith. That's the dead kind. It's a delusion. You're just kidding yourself. You don't have the genuine article. You don't have the real thing, but faith that's real, faith that's genuine is a faith that's alive. And a faith that's alive, you'll see it. You'll see it in what a person does. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, James is getting bold here, and he's basically calling us out. It's like he's giving us a challenge. He's saying basically this, look, if you're one of those people who says, look, faith and action, they're just two separate things, and you can have one and not have the other. He says, okay, fine, if that's what you think, here's my challenge. In fact, it's almost like a dare. He says, I dare you. He says, you show me your faith, but you can't do anything. Show me your faith without doing a thing. You can't do anything, but I want to see your faith. Now, if in that scenario, what are you left with? Well, you're left with your thoughts, and I can't see those. You're left with your feelings, what you're feeling on, on the inside. I can't see that either. And you're left with your words. Now, I can hear your words, but how do I know they're real? You could be lying to me. So all you're left with is words, thoughts, and feelings. And then James says, look, if that's how you want to show me your faith, that's fine. But what if I showed you my faith and I didn't say a word? I just showed you my faith by what I did, how I lived. He said, you'd see everything you needed to see. And he gives us an example then. He goes on, and he's, he's illustrating it more, and he's getting even more bold. I, I, I love this, but this is so tough. Verse 19, he says, you believe there's one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. <laughs> I mean, James is so bold right here. Look at what he says. He says, look, think about it. Demons believe in God. In fact... The demons even believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose from the dead. They know that's true. They believe that. In fact, he's showing us that demons believe pretty much everything you believe if you're a Christian. 
And then he even goes further. He says, not only do they believe what you believe, they also what? They shudder. That's an emotion. Now that's emotion, see? He's talking about the kind of faith that affects not only what I think, but it affects how I feel. So he's saying, look, demons pretty much believe what you believe. They think the thoughts that you think. They even feel some of the same emotions that you feel. And their faith, still dead. Still won't save them. That's tough. And then he illustrates his point even further. And this time he's going to reach way back into the Old Testament, back into the old part of the Bible. And he's going to pull from there and illustrate this. Look at what he says in verse 20. He says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, you may not be familiar with this story, but if you're a Bible person, you probably know this story. But I'll give you a quick recap. God comes to a man named Abraham long before, long before Jesus, thousands of years. And he says, Abraham, I'm going to make a promise to you, a covenant between the two of us. I'm going to build a nation out of your family. I'm going to give you a family, and from that family, I'm going to build a nation. And I'm going to have a special relationship with this nation. And I'm going to begin to show the world who I really am. But what's really coming is I'm going to bring a Savior, a Messiah, through that nation. And once and for all, I'm going to reveal to the world exactly what I'm like and and what I want my relationship to the world to be. And he said, this promise, this time, when when the Messiah comes, he'll usher in a covenant that's not just for a nation, not just with a family, but to the entire world. And so God begins to bring about this promise through Abraham. He gives him a son. His son's name is Isaac. And the promise is going fine. The nation, although it's very small in in its infant stages, it's beginning to, to grow. And Abraham is believing in this promise that God has made to him. And then God comes to Abraham one day and he says, now I need to know if you really trust me. Not just trusting in the son that I gave you or trusting in this promise that you and I have between us. I need to know, do you trust me? I need to know, would you be willing to sacrifice this son, the son that's supposed to build this nation that I promised to you, would you sacrifice this son to me? And so Abraham goes about doing that. and He he begins to offer his son Isaac to God. And right at the moment where he's about to do that, God stops him and he says, now I know. Now I know you don't just trust in the promise. You don't just trust in your son or your family or your own ability. But you trust in me. This is what James is referring to. And now he's going to make a comment on it. And look what he says. He says, you can see that Abraham's faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. So you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Now don't miss what James just did there. He linked several words together in the way that, he, that, that they're supposed to be. He says, look, Abraham's faith and then Abraham's actions, they came together. And when that happened, he said his faith was made complete. Then he makes another illustration, which we don't have time to get into. But then he makes this one final statement about everything that he said. And he says, look, verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, if you've been in church any amount of time or you've been a Christian for a while and you've maybe read your Bible a little bit, I need to address an elephant in the room because there's something that you probably have been thinking this whole time that caused some questions. You may be thinking, doesn't that, I mean, I get what James is saying and and it makes sense, I guess, but I think maybe he's contradicting something else that I've read in the Bible, specifically some of the things that Well, the Apostle Paul teaches in in the Bible. I mean, specifically, something that he wrote in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And I want to read that to you right now because it sounds like a contradiction. Look at what Paul says. He said, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Well, okay now, which is it? I mean, are we saved by faith alone and it's regardless of what we do in our actions? Or are we saved by faith and actions put together? Which is it? In fact, if you've been around here any length of time, you've probably heard me and and Nathan and Ed and guys from our stage and and people right there at your your campus say, 
look, there's nothing you can do to earn God's love. There's nothing you can do to, to earn a relationship with God. You can't be good enough to make God accept you. And it's not about what you do. It's about trusting in God and his grace that he grants to you and all of that stuff. And you're thinking, well, come on, man, what is it? I mean, uh, which one is it? Sounds like you're, we've got a dilemma here. But in reality, it's not a dilemma. And, and I want to show you how. It's actually pretty simple, and I'm going to do my best to explain it. I want to read these verses one more time. Ephesians 2, verses uh, 8 and 9. But this time, we're going to read verse 10. Because I found a lot of people read verses 8 and 9, but they forget to read verse 10. And I think it brings it all into perspective. Here's what it says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10. For... We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, I think it's pretty clear from this passage that there's an order to all of these things. And when you get it out of order, that's when you get into trouble. And it's important for you to understand what order they come in. You and I, we're not saved by our works through our faith so that we can get grace on the back end. That's backwards. You've got it out of order. Look at it again. He says, we're saved by grace, which is God's undeserved favor. Now, how does that grace come to us? Well, we get it through our faith or our trust in God. That's not something we do to earn it. We just lean into God, and he gives that to us. But notice, what does that faith do in us? What's that faith for? More specifically, what does it result in? It results in our good works or our actions that we wind up doing that God has intended for us to do from the beginning. So again, let me be clear. You and I, we don't get in a right relationship with God, or we're not saved by what we do. Because see, if if you could make yourself right with God by the things that you do, if I could earn uh, my way into a good relationship with God, then then God would have made a mistake when he sent Jesus to die for my sins. See, if my good works could pay the penalty for my sin and put me right with God, then Jesus didn't have to die, and the cross was for nothing. We know that's not true. See, good works can't save you. So why is it that James is just so adamant about it? Because our actions, they authenticate our faith. See? They prove that the work that God has done in me, that the grace that I have received has really been received, that I have a genuine faith. See, is it possible for someone to maintain, a, 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 to have a genuine faith in God, to really truly believe and to trust in Jesus and just not have had time to perform any good works because of that faith? Absolutely. But God sees our heart. See, God knows every inclination you've ever had. He knows every thought. He knows every motive that you and I have. But in the end, and this is the point that James is trying to get us to see, in the end, genuine faith always will reveal itself through our actions. And that's what James is so concerned about. And it's what you're concerned about. It's the thing that I'm concerned about. It's the thing that we, we just, when we see it, it just makes us up so upset. It's what we're so concerned with. When we see someone who claims to have faith and their life doesn't match, they say one thing, they do another. When you get discouraged and you get all fed up like I do with the hypocrisy that I see in the world and in some people, James says, yeah, me too. And he's calling that out. And he's calling out people who claim to have faith, yet they just refuse to obey Jesus. In other words, they choose to not follow his way for their lives. He's saying, look, that refusal to follow and obey Jesus... That reveals you haven't trusted God yet. You haven't received his grace. Jesus illustrated it this way. He said, by by their fruits, that's how you're going to recognize them. He says, if there's a good tree, it's going to produce good fruit. If it's a bad tree, it's going to produce bad fruit. See, at the end of the day, our actions, they reveal the authenticity of our faith. Now, does that mean Christians are perfect? Does that mean that... There won't be hypocrites, and I won't be a hypocrite every so often. Of course not. You know that's true. But it does mean this. True, authentic, genuine, saving faith will always reveal itself in a person's life. 
faith that's alive. Faith that, 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 that is genuine is a faith that works. And a faith that has no effect on a person's life, that's the counterfeit. It's useless. It's a delusion. It's dead. So, so what do you do with that? Well, I think the Apostle Paul said it best when he, he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said this. He said, examine yourselves and see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. See, I think you and I, all of us, we owe ourselves this. You ought to put your life under a microscope. And this ought to happen on a regular basis. I mean, ask yourself these questions. Is my faith, the faith that I claim to have in God, is it making any difference in this life that I'm living? I mean... <laughs> Does what I believe, does it ever move me to take any sort of action? Or is it just an intellectual faith? Is it just about what I think? Or is it just about what I feel? Is it just about getting a feeling that, that me and God are okay? Is it just like a safety net that I'm using to hopefully get me to a better place when I die? Is that all this is? Or am I like a tree that is supposed to put out fruit, but... There's nothing there. There's nothing on the end of those branches. And, and you may be saying, well, how do I know that? How, how do you figure that out? Well, I think it's pretty simple. The rise of Scripture made it very clear. They say it this way. The fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the proof that your faith is real, that it's genuine, that you, you have it. It'll look like this. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the qualities that true faith will produce in you throughout your lifetime. Now, not perfectly and not all at once, but it'll happen. It'll be there. And you owe it to yourself. I owe it to myself. Spend some serious time thinking about this, asking these questions. Now, my suggestion is you shouldn't do this alone. In fact, we say this around here all the time. None of us can follow Jesus by ourselves. We need other people. And there comes a point in time when I need someone else who loves me, who follows Jesus, to look at my life and give me an outside view and say, here's what I see and here's what I don't see and, and loves me enough to encourage me when I'm when I'm producing that fruit, and loves me enough to correct me when I'm not. That's why we say everybody ought to be in a little community, not just sitting in a row facing the front every Sunday and just listening to God's Word, but it, you ought to be circling up and looking at someone face-to-face -face and, and, and doing this for one another, loving and encouraging and even correcting one another when it's needed. So I'll just leave you with these two questions, and these are the questions that you owe yourself to ask every now and then. And only you can answer these questions. Is your faith alive? Or is it dead? Why don't you stand? And I'll pray for us as we dismiss. Wow, God, this is, uh, this is humbling for some of us. It is for me. Because it causes me to, to seriously evaluate. Because I... A lot of us, if they're like me, they, they claim a lot of things. We claim to have faith and to trust you. But God, help us to, to do a true heart check and to ask ourselves, is my faith alive? Is it, is it changing me? Is it doing anything? What are my actions? Am I producing the kind of fruit that your spirit produces when it's present and God, wherever we see adjustments that need to be made, I pray that we would have the courage to do it. We'd make those adjustments. And God, that we would trust you even more. And that we would see that fruit of your spirit coming out in our lives. And we would know that our faith is alive. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for being here, guys. We will see you next week for our next installment in the series, Gym Class. Have a good week.